Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the show. I am here with... I'm here with no one. There's nobody here. Sky is in the bathroom. Christian is in the gutter somewhere along Clark Street in Chicago. She went to the um, Cubs game last night where they actually won in the World Series, and she was out so late she couldn't get back in time. Sky is returning shortly to the show after he goes to the bathroom, because that's more important. Biology before theology, that's what I always say. And uh, I'm supposed to be interviewing N.T. Wright right now. Yes, the N.T. Wright, a.k.a. Dr. Wright, a.k.a. Tom. Here comes Sky. Oh, sorry. He looks 12 ounces lighter. I had more tea in me than Boston Harbor in 1776. <laughs> So we have no, we we can't find NT right. We had a show lined up. We had a great show lined up. We it it'll all be okay. I have his book. I have his book here. I can even hold it up. The day the revolution began, reconsidering the meaning of Jesus crucifixion by NT Wright, author of Simply Christian and the new book Why I Won't Go on a Podcast with Phil Vischer. Well, let's wait. Let's not accuse him. There could be a simple. There could be a simple error of communication. Yeah. What if he was kidnapped? I would feel terrible. You know what? I, this is this is about Brexit. They're not allowed this to communicate Brexit. outside the UK because, now. Because yes, they left the the union, so now their their uh, cords have been tied. <laughs> is that the term? I think that's the term. When I, Brexit. They tie oh, I was thinking of tubes tied. That's tubes, a whole different yeah, thing. Under the ones that go under the. The channel. Under the channel and across the ocean so that we can talk to them on Skype. We can't talk to... We've lost the UK. London is down. What's the name of that London movie? London has fallen. Yes. <laughs> London falling. Da, 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 da. Um, so we don't have a guest. And we don't really have a plan. And we don't really have a plan. So what could possibly going wrong... Going is... It's already going wrong. <laughs> Whatever could go wrong. But the Cubs won. They did win yesterday. So that's that good. was I gotta exciting. The, wait, I got to do the theme song. I have to. When everything's falling apart. Uh, what's that? Oh, it, it's it's Drew what? Dick. Oh, we we sent out a text to Drew uh, Dick to see if he was available. Is he available? Well, he, hold on, I didn't tell him what I was texting him about. Oh, great. <laughs> so he he's, he, uh, he he says, "Can we talk in thirty? I, I'm going to tell in him 30 what in thirty minutes. minutes. No. Hold on, Drew. No. Oh, you just do your thing. I'm going to okay. text him. Okay. So we don't have uh, N.T. Wright. We're trying to find him. We're trying to find... I'm tweeting about him. We're looking for his assistant. We're looking for his PR person. Uh, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows his cat. Hey, hey, wait. I forgot which key I'm in. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And all we got is video. Hey, it's a podcast. So in and here, the Feel of Issue podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi. I might leave too. I think I might be done. This party could be over. This is where the theme song ends because there's no one else to talk to. So, hey, it's a podcast. So, in and here, the Feel Vision Podcast starts right here. The Feel Vision Podcast starts right here. Is it, has uh, NT Wright showed up? Has anyone seen NT Wright? Anyone? We got to put out an HP. Oh! Drew Dick says, give me five. Oh, we're going to have Drew Dick on in five minutes. Okay, we only have to talk about uh, Jack. Tra- you, Jack. Here, I'm going to send you guys Jack. his number so Jack. you figure Jack. this out. <laughs> oh, I see him, but I don't hear him. Hey. Why don't I hear him? We don't hear yet. Make sure your mic is enabled. There's a button. Oh. Hey. Game guys. Yeah, we got to turn him up. <laughs> okay. I've got controls. Still waking up out here, but yeah. So how long ago did you put that shirt on? <laughs> Wait, is it... we don't hear him? Yeah. Okay. I'll make him. Lo- no, that's me. I'm making louder. I'll make. See, this usually we we do this before uh, we start rolling. This is this should really be a behind the scenes video at this point because it's so. I think the whole season is a behind the scenes. Drew, if you can hear me, I just want you to know if we actually do okay. connect with NT Wright, I am dropping you like a bad habit. Like really quick. We're not even going to say thanks or goodbye. We're just going to cut you off. Don't take offense. Okay. I'm, can you hear me? Oh, you can't hear me. Barely. Yeah. I'm, I'm the Canadian NT Wright, okay? But you're in Portland. 
That's true. <laughs> but he's from Canada. Wait, okay. Yeah, come on, man. Don't don't take that from me. What does your mug say? What's that? What does your mug say? Oh, my mug. Oh, it says, uh, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. Um, what are you up to, Drew? Drew, how you been? What you doing? <laughs> That's good dreams. Did he say having dreams? <laughs> I don't know. Having some good dreams. Oh, having some good I mean, dr dreams. That's yeah, nice. I, I, that's how long I've been up. Yeah, fantastic. Well, you 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 look no worse for wear. Thank you, thank you. Are that's you the still thing about me? I can pop out of bed and just look perfect. Yeah, I know. That's we all admire that about you and envy it. To be quite honest, um, I keep getting emails from like CT pastors, Christianity Today pastors that have your picture on them, but I thought you'd run off to the great Northwest and we're no longer associating with any of us. I, yeah, they keep my face around, I think just because it's Health Magazine. <laughs> Clearly, you see that face, you just want to throw money at it. Are you, are you working with CT pastors? Yes, on a part-time basis. I okay. write a newsletter for them and uh, contribute an article here and there and, and do some editorial work. So. Okay. So, you know, this is our last podcast before the election. It is. Yeah. No, uh, no, we're, 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 It'll release on Tuesday. The next one will release on, on so the next election day. the podcast will come out during the election. It'll come out while people are voting. Right. So we can't swing their votes. I think we've swung them enough. <laughs> Drew, uh, Portland, uh, Christians in Portland, how is the election going down? A lot of, a lot of Trump fever out here. Um, no, um, not, no not so much. Uh, yeah, you know, I, do I have my finger on the pulse enough to say what the Christians in Portland are feeling about this election? Uh, you know, it's a pretty blue state. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I think they're kind of like, not into either candidate from what I'm getting. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of people that were feeling the burn. Of course, that's no longer an option. So right. there's the angry Jill Stein right inners. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people that are just kind of like, whatever. Well, what wasn't, um, there are a lot of uh, Southern Baptists in Oregon, aren't there? Isn't there a strange population of Southern Baptists because of the uh, uh, mining industry and some things that happened in the late 19th century? That is news to me, oh, okay. but I'm glad to hear of it. <laughs> this is <laughs> Phil's, <laughs> Phil's imaginary church history. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was, there was, or maybe that's in just Mine, in Northern California when logging. the gold, it was a gold rush. It was the, the gold rush brought Southern oh. Baptists to the Northwest because one of the first gold rushes was in Georgia. And, and so people that knew how to mine for gold were Southerners. So there's a lot of Southerners. I am kind of making that up. No, I'm not making it up. I heard that. This doesn't make Somewhere. people want to purchase your I'm DVD <laughs> series on what's in the Bible. Because you could have just made it up. Drew, um, do you yes. think the death of Jack Chick was the biggest news story of the last week? Was to me. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's because my usual Halloween thing is to hand out healthy snacks and Jack Chick tracks. Uh -huh. <laughs> Unfortunately... <laughs> I just don't feel right about doing it this year with him gone. Do you feel like there's anyone capable of filling his his shoes? Matt Walsh. He's got it, man. Matt. He's got the temperament. Matt Walsh. Matt Walsh. Blogger. Oh. Come oh, on, guys. Where have you been? I know, Sky. Do you he, know anyway. Matt Walsh? Not really. Okay. Check him out. Yeah, he's, okay. uh, he's pretty angry. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying he's always wrong. But, uh, but is he a folk artist? Oh, no, that's true. He doesn't have the artistic yeah. imagination of a Jack Chick. Well, yeah. What's your favorite? Definitely the anger. Definitely the anger. What's your favorite Chick tract? I have, I don't remember whole tracts. I, I remember pages. I remember, and it's mostly people in hell. Yeah. Flames, demons, terrible things. And then like well, drawings of drug paraphernalia or, you know, bad things right. that people do. But, you know, Jack, yeah. Jack. Chick was really just, he was kind of the um, 20th century evangelical embodiment of the Sistine Chapel. Come again? If you look at the, 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 the Last Judgment, the big, huge painting in the Sistine Chapel, yeah. it shows like people being skinned alive. Is there and drug paraphernalia? 
like syringes and I don't think needles. So. But that's what I'm saying. He's the 20th century oh, version of okay. it. Oh, okay. So this isn't like new to Christianity. But did he draw the happy parts? Because at least... I don't know. At least Michelangelo yeah. drew the happy parts. Because at the end of some of his tracks, he'd have like, a, this could have been your life. You know? Yeah, you could I mean, have that, been that's happy. That's my favorite Jack Chick track is This Is Your Life, I think it's called, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I remember you, that one. You always get before the Great White Throne, right? You get the life review, and then it shows the guy doing like all these bad things, right? Yeah. And he gets pitched into hell. Right. At the end, for all, with all the other Catholics. Uh, that was the great thing about Jack. You know, he... he uh, he, he went after everyone, but anyway, he threw. Who, uh, who did not he throw into hell? Exactly, what? everyone got pitched in at some point. Anyway, but he had the this could have been your life, and then at the end, you know, the guys walking into the white light. So. Yeah, sun, I, sunrise and glory. Aren't forever. you really curious to know what his first conversation with the Lord is like? Yeah, after dying, is there? Is could we Skype in on the, on that? With any more luck than we're having with NT, right? I don't. Maybe, but I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just really curious. Like he he spent he spent his career telling people what the afterlife is going to be like for yeah, them. Right. And now, now we assume he is experiencing he's it. He's experiencing what it is for him. Well, would he go back life, and revise it? Review. Yeah. What if he's sitting in purgatory right now? Wouldn't we all be a little embarrassed? Why? Because he didn't. Because really... we've been saying purgatory doesn't exist since the Reformation. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> There's Jack Chick writing a, a cartoon about purgatory and not able to send it to us. Aren't there a bunch of uh, spoofs on his stuff? Like um... probably are. Like Jack Brick, which is Lego versions of Chick tracks. There is a Brick Bible. I know that. The Brick Testament. I yeah, think it's called. Yeah, right? yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I, I know that, but there's not. Were a there track. any? You know, what's the... The guy, okay, just as far as, like, from a publishing perspective, he was a phenom, right? I mean, yeah. billions of check trick. I forget the exact stat, but he's, like, the best-selling author of our time, technically, or something like that. Right. Because, yeah, anyway. But, of course, like, they were purchased in bulk for pennies each. But uh, That's not the point. That's I've I sold... 900 million copies. Wow. That's the stat That's, I'm, I'm seeing here. I sold 5 million vegucational books but what i sold five million vegucational books you didn't know that did you vegucational yeah yeah they were the first veggie tales books it was like bob and larry's abc's and stuff uh, okay. but what we don't tell you shh, what we don't tell you is that the vast majority of those were giveaways at chick-fil-a but chick-fil-a paid for them well that's not a giveaway so our Publish well, Chick Fil. They, were they gave them meals. away, but Chick Fil A yeah, bought the books meals. from you. Yeah, but it doesn't really count. I, I thought you were going to say that you left them in bathroom stalls, <laughs> like Jack Chick tracks, <laughs> which would have been. Yeah, we should. Okay, what else is going on? Uh, Drew, come on, give us a story. Come on, besides the disappearance of NT Wright that the whole world is concerned about, uh, give us a story. I've never heard of this NT Wright guy, but um, I just like how you. Lost him and immediately thought of me. Yeah, yeah, we were going down <laughs> the list. <laughs> Don't tell me how far down I was Boy, on the list. You got to watch that first step. It's a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm honored. And unfortunately, yeah. of course, I didn't get the usual 10 hours of prep I do before I appear on the, the show. So I hope my performance doesn't suffer. That's okay. We're so, all we're all suffering what, equally. What are you following at uh, C Church C C T Pastors, whatever that thing's called now? Um, that would be of interest. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know, it, it's a pretty practical site. I love that we're getting the plug here. Uh, Kyle Rohane, I'm working with him. He's the managing editor now. Um, but you know, one thing he just came back from he was telling me is the um, uh, theologian pastor conference. You know, there have been like a raft of books about being a, a pastor theologian recently, yeah. which I love, right? Because it's sort of saying, hey, pastors, don't be a CEO, don't be a visionary cultural architect. Let's be theologians, actually. So yeah. you think it's a backlash to the, the pragmatic leadership stuff that's been around for a few decades now? That's my take. Yeah, I think so. And I welcome it. I think it's good. But, um, but if, we, if we're more worried about theology than our, our presentations, how will we get people to show up? You're assuming people don't care question. about theology. Do they? Some. Enough? The ones that are buying those books. Enough to fill our parking lots? I don't know. But if you really just want to fill parking lots, there's easier ways to do it. 
One of those gorilla balloons, the gorilla balloons at the car dealerships. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got an email from N.T. Wright. What does he say? Oh, my goodness. He exists? He's upstaging me. He's upstaging me. <laughs> what does he say? What does he say? Uh, there's a mix-up. He said I was sitting, uh, he was waiting for our call, but we told the publicist that he had to click the link, so there's a bit of a mix-up on that technical end. Oh, uh, uh, I don't know if our listeners heard that. So is, is he available or is he now not available? Well, I don't, do you guys want to try? I could ask. Just ask him if he's available, and uh, as we may just say this is this week's show, and then <laughs> stop and record next week's show. Can I tell? Can I tell my NT Wright story? Really yeah, quick? please, please. I'm pretty proud of it. Okay, so back when I was at CT full time, a few colleagues and I—I I don't know, Sky, if you were still around, or um, I don't think you're involved with this one, but anyway, uh, we decided to do a sort of Chuck Norris facts on NT Wright. So we had a picture of NT Wright's uh, face like uh, uh, photoshopped onto Chuck Norris's head and he was doing like a front kick and there's an explosion behind him. And we had all these silly things about how um, he doesn't parse Greek verbs, they decline before him and all these, you know, ridiculous facts. It was pretty, pretty immature and silly anyway, but I sent it to him because we had his email address. So I shot it to him thinking he's never going to respond. And I forget what I said, something about like, I don't know what you'll think about this, but thought I'd share it with you. He responds in like 10 seconds, maybe 30, and just says, it amazes me to think of how much time some people have on their hands. Oh, oh. That's, a, a, that's a compliment. I took that as a compliment. That's a compliment. I don't know. Right? I think that oh, was an English a, burn. That's a compliment. <laughs> oh, the English burn. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Drew. Oh, thanks for talking to have me. Have a great See day. Guys. We'll do it again next week. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the show. I'm here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Hi, Sky. How you doing? We're tethered. And we have a special guest. We're sharing a pair of headphones for reasons that I'm not going to elaborate on right now. And we have a special guest that I've been tweeting about for three hours because we were hoping that our elves could run across uh, UK everywhere and find him. We figured you were probably in a pub somewhere and someone would have to come and, and, and dig you out. But Wouldn't that be nice? Sadly, <laughs> no. I've been at the desk most of the day. <laughs> uh, we are here with N.T. Wright, and uh, we don't have a ton of time because he has other stuff to do. So I got to sing the theme song. Here we go. Hey, it's a podcast. What do you know? Hey, it's a podcast. And we got video. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Vischer podcast starts right here. Oh, we'll talk to Sky. Hi, Phil. But Christian's gone because she was at the Cubs game last night, the World Series, and she was up too late, and she's somewhere in Wrigleyville. Uh, we've got a guest, he, and I'm singing a song about him. I wrote a little song about him at the end that I'll sing for you. Hey, it's a podcast. So lend an ear. The Phil Vischer podcast starts right here. The Phil Vischer podcast starts right here. Okay. <laughs> That's how we start the show. That's how we roll. Um, our guest is Dr. Are you a reverend? Dr. Re how many things can we put before your name? Uh, as many or as few as you like. Yes. I I'm, I'm, was ordained 40 years ago and I was made a bishop about um, 17 years ago. No. Uh, no, 12 years ago. So okay. um, I'm, I'm reverend and right reverend and professor that, and doctor and a few other things. That's fantastic. Wow. That's fantastic. <laughs> I think uh, he might take the title of our guest. With, with the most titles. Right. You're the, the most titled title that we have. Um, the right reverend, Dr. N.T. Wright, one of the world's leading Bible scholars, chair of New Testament and early Christianity at the School of Divinity at the University of St. Andrews. That's in Scotland. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I just want to know that I'm, you know, getting... Edinburgh. Edinburgh. No, well, is it? Edinburgh is um, an hour's drive southeast of here. Ah. Ah. Well, you're wrong. <laughs> Think golf. <laughs> an, an Anglican bishop and best-selling author. He's been featured on ABC News, The Colbert Report, Dateline, Fresh Air, Fresh Air. Do you like Terry Gross? Did you have fun with Terry Gross? Uh, all I remember is it was all done down the line, rather like this is, except I don't think I saw him like I can see you guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a girl. So if you'd seen her... You, oh, uh, no, so you were... Terry in, is a she? Terry, yeah. yeah, the host of... But maybe uh, maybe you were interviewed I'm by, sorry, this was a long time ago. I, <laughs> I, I haven't been on the show since. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, and the author Stephen of... Stephen Colbert, I do remember. And yeah. he's definitely a he. <laughs> he's definitely a he. Um, and you've written... Do you know off the top of your head how many books you've written now? 
Uh, no, but somebody added it up and said it was around 80, give or take. A- 80? Yeah. Wow. 80. zero. That's, that's a significant number. Uh, yeah, I guess. It's a little more than I have years of my life, but uh, well, there and, we are. And what's crazy about it, I remember the first book of yours I ever read was uh, Jesus and the Victory of God. And it, what is okay. that, a five or 600-page book? Uh, six, maybe, 650, yeah, it, something like that. These are not small, these, these are not, not pamphlets. No, these aren't, no. These are big, yeah, huge, right, right. academic So you've So works. you've written more than a book a year in your working life. Uh, I suppose so, yes. So I didn't really get going till I was about in my late 30s or early 40s. Okay. And then I kind of made up for lost time since then. But, but of course, quite a few of the books, yeah, so, some of the books are big, Quite a few of them are really quite small, and quite a lot of them consist of lectures and sermons and addresses and things that I've done at various times. Okay. So if I go around lecturing and then somebody collects up the bits and pieces and puts it together, it's quite easy to make a book that way. Right. And that's how the Apostle Paul worked, too, right? Other people uh, just... Kind of... Well, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, Dr. Wright is an expert on Paul. I don't I know. know if you want to I know. I, you know, challenge him on this. I want to I have a Paul off. See who knows more about Paul. Okay, uh, the new book is The Day the Revelation Began. Revolution. Re- revolution, sorry. The Day the Revolution Began. It's not nice to mispronounce someone else's book title. No. That's really not. I never, when, when people say vegetals, I don't like that. I say, no, it's veggie tales. No one says vegetable, ve- Ve- vegetals. Vegetals? I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking that Pat Robertson said that once, but I'm not sure. The day the revolution began, reconsidering the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion. Um, And it's 412 pages. Right. Without, and then there's the acknowledgments and the notes and and everything else. That's it. Okay, I'm just going to jump right in because, you know, because you've got better things to do with your time. (laughs) Like write another book. Um, That's an awful lot of writing about something that we already know. We already know what Jesus' crucifixion was about. It was to save us from our sins. Yes and no. Um, Of course, that is basically true. The trouble is that we have put that truth within a different narrative, a different story in the Western Church, both Catholic and Protestant, actually, and that the story which we have told, which is about how we've all failed God's big examination, and so we all have to go to hell, and so instead of that, something else is going to happen. That story is a distortion of the story the Bible actually tells, and really my book is trying to unscramble the distortion and trying to tell the biblical story uh, in a more biblical way. Uh, okay, so you, part of the argument you make in the book is that this distortion in the Western Church is uh largely due to medieval theologies, particularly that of purgatory, and the Reformers' desire to address that false teaching. Can you unpack how purgatory got us to the common view yeah. of the crucifixion P- that we purgatory, hold? Purgatory is, is, in a sense, a side issue. It goes back behind that. It goes back to the framing of theology in the high Middle Ages in terms of uh, a picture of going to heaven or going to hell, as in Dante's Sistine, Sistine Ch- Dante's um, uh, Inferno mm-hmm. and, and Paradiso, uh, with Purgatorio in the middle, or then um, Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, where you have this big picture of Jesus in the middle, sending some people upstairs and some people downstairs, basically. And that image uh, of how you tell a would-be biblical story has haunted the imagination of Western Christianity. And then uh, in late medieval Catholicism, there were all sorts of schemes about how you might eventually get to heaven, and of course you'd have to do time in purgatory first and so on. And the reformers were reacting to the doctrine about purgatory um, because that had produced all sorts of corruptions and abuses and people paying to get relatives out of um, so many years in purgatory or whatever it was. And the reformers were trying to rearticulate a theology of the cross that would address that and other abuses as well. But they didn't uh, unpick the larger scheme, which was, as I say, to do with basically heaven and hell. Now, part of the difficulty is when I say this, people say, oh, so you don't believe in hell, are you a universalist? And I say, no, I'm, I'm not a universalist. I've never been a universalist. But uh, what, what we have in the New Testament is God's plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth 
in Christ. So it isn't a matter of leaving earth and going to heaven. It isn't a matter of saved souls leaving bodies and going into a disembodied state. It's a matter of God's ultimate purpose of bringing heaven and earth together and recreating human beings to be genuine human beings, risen from the dead, in that new world. And once you say that that's the end game towards which the whole New Testament is working, then the question of the cross as dealing with the problems which prevent us from getting there has to be reframed and rethought from top to bottom. And that's what I've been trying to do in the book. Okay, okay. So you, so you say <laughs> once we get the goal right, that it's about the new creation and not just heaven, uh, then we have to get—and we've talked about that quite a bit on the podcast. And even on—I I did a series for kids called What's in the Bible, which is walking whole families th- all the way through the Bible. Although every time right. I, I read one of your books or one of Dallas Willard's books, I always think, oh, i got to go back and tweak a few things. But I did my best with the material I had at the time. Um, and th- but that was one thing that, that we hit pretty heavily, is that the Bible doesn't end with us going to heaven. It ends with a new heaven and a new earth and us exactly. being invited to be a part of it. So, okay, so, exactly. uh, so we're good. We're good. We got that. We're with you there. Uh, then you say the second problem that we have to correct is uh, th- to properly diagnose the human problem, that it's not... Yeah just about sin because because jesus yeah. died for us because of our sins right so how is it not just about sin well it's not just about sin because the uh, the way that genesis 1 2 and 3 set it up is not that god is setting the human beings a kind of big moral exam which they all flunk um it's jesus that is that god is setting human beings a task a vocation which is to be his image reflectors which is to reflect the worship of all creation to god and reflect the wise stewardship of god into creation now of course to do that to do any all of that um requires uh human obedience and if humans as paul says worship and serve the creature rather than the creator then it isn't just that here is a moral law and you have broken it. It's that here is a vocation to which you should aspire, and you have turned away from it and done the opposite. So that, yeah, that is sin, but our modern conceptions of sin, which are simply breaking almost arbitrary laws that God made up, uh, simply isn't getting us anywhere near what the actual vocation is about. I'll tell you, one of the breakthrough moments for me when I was doing some lectures on this a few years ago was rereading the book of Revelation, where in chapter 5 it says, Worthy is the Lamb, because by his blood he ransomed humans for God to make them not dwellers in heaven, but the royal priesthood, kings and priests. And that's the sense of the purpose of the cross, is to restore the original human vocation. Now, in order to do that, you have to deal with the problem of sin. But back of sin is the problem of idolatry, of of a failure of worship. And that's the thing which, for most Western Christians, they they all say, okay, yeah, idolatry isn't a good thing, um, but kind of we don't do that because we don't make these graven images these days. And I think people fail to realize how... When people sin, it's because, deep down, they are worshipping something other than the God in whose image they are made. Okay, so if you you go back into Genesis 1 and 2 and the original vocation of humanity to be a priesthood, to mediate between the creation and the Creator, and that Jesus' death, in a way, takes away that sin, what do you do with the, the common narrative that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins, that he takes upon himself the wrath that we deserve as those who have violated God's law. That seemed to be what I was always taught as a yeah, younger person. Yeah. How does that fit into the broader yeah. narrative and, you're describing? And, and it, is, it is what I was taught as a younger person. And in all sorts of ways, uh, I would say something like that still has to be said, but it's within the larger context, because God... Uh, of course, loves his good creation. He loves his human creatures and anything that spoils or destroys or distorts his good creation um, is abhorrent to him. So God is, of course, angry about that and with that. And so it is perfectly proper to think of God being wrathful against, say, uh, obvious examples, child abuse or genocide or whatever. Um, 
Uh, and the, the, the trouble is that we have allowed ourselves to slide back all too easily into a picture which is basically a pagan picture, not a Jewish or Christian one, of a malevolent, capricious God, of a kind of a moody or grumpy God who just gets cross with people and so lashes out. And fortunately for us, somebody else got in the way. Oh, it happened to be his own son, so that makes it all right. Now, I know that no serious preacher or theologian would ever say it like that, but I have worked with, quote, ordinary Christians, unquote, for a long time, and it's clear that something like that distorted narrative is what a lot of people have heard, what they think they're being asked to believe, and they hear that message and they say, uh, well, if that's who God is, I really don't like him at all. He seems a bully, and right. I know bullies in my own life who claim they love me, but actually they're just bullies, and I don't want another one in heaven, thank you very much. <laughs> and so we, we've got to get we've got to get behind that caricature. And um, you know, there are some people for whom it would have been easier if John three sixteen had said, "God so hated the world that he killed his only son." And in fact, John says, "God so loved the world that he gave his only son." And until that becomes um, the most natural thing to say about the cross, then we haven't yet told the bigger story properly. And the and the revolution, um, you know, Paul, you say, was kind of launch or, or realize that he was part of launching this revolution. Um, the problem is not just that human. I'm quoting from the book, the problem is not just that humans have misbehaved and need punishing. The problem is that their idolatry coming to expression in sin has resulted in slavery for themselves and for the whole creation. Um, so that there are, are powers, forces that have been given control uh, that, and, and that's what Jesus is breaking at the crucifixion. Yeah. And, and this is this is very difficult because we don't have good language for talking about the dark, non-human powers that have usurped authority over the world. And actually, they didn't have terribly good language for it in the first century either. But I do know that people today, politicians, news commentators, will talk about economic forces or the forces of political sentiment or whatever it may be. And we don't know what these forces are, but they seem to be bigger than the sum total of the humans who uh, are inhabiting those, those situations. And that's kind of a loose modern analogy when we talk about forces like that. And in the ancient world, they developed this quite thoroughly. And you see it in Paul and you see it in John. For instance, in John, where Jesus talks about, uh, now is the ruler of this world cast out, and that if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. What he's saying is that the world has been in the power of a dark force who is not easy to name, let alone to identify, but that what Jesus is going to do on the cross will break the power of that dark force and thereby liberate the world that is uh, at present under the under that authority. Wow. That, that's, that's the revolution. Does that fit then with a ransom theory of the atonement or a Christus Victor kind of theology? How do these overlap? Well, they, <laughs> they, all, they all fit in sooner or later. And one of the things that I would say about all the different theories is that they're basically all true, but we need the larger biblical narrative to frame them. Otherwise, they end up getting played off against one another. This is why I stress in the book that when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, the Messiah died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, in accordance with the Bible, what that means is you have to understand that entire biblical narrative, and then and only then do you see what the Messiah died for our sins means. Otherwise, you put it in some other narrative, like see that the, the ransom thing was uh, we, God had to pay this ransom to the devil or something to get people out of out of jail. And that's because you take the ransom language away from its home base, which is the Exodus, and remember that Jesus chose Passover, the Exodus festival, as the moment to do what had to be done. He didn't choose the Day of Atonement. He might have done. He chose Passover because this is primarily a release from slavery by the defeat of the dark power. The trouble is that with Israel in exile, and then with the human race in exile from the garden. Um, the exile is not just an accidental slavery, it's a slavery we have colluded at through our own sin. That's why sin has to be dealt with, but not just because I've been very naughty and God wants to punish me, but because my sin and idolatry hand to the powers the authority which I 
as a God-reflecting human being, ought to be having over the world. And so the powers then... Ex- it, you know, it's kind of complicated. I appreciate that. Um, my publisher said to me um, a year or two ago, he said, Tom, I need to teach you the meaning of the word simple or simply. <laughs> and and I, my answer, which is in one of my books, is if somebody says to me here, tell me how I drive to Glasgow and keep it simple, then I could say, keep on just going west and south and you can't miss it. But it might be kind to them to tell them that there's a river 10 miles wide in between here and there. And there's, if you go the other way, there's a range of mountains. So a little bit of complexity might actually help. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. Right. And it's the same with atonement theory. Unfortunately, we live in an environment in the church, especially in the United States, that doesn't tolerate complexity, complexity or nuance anymore. does not fill the pews. No. Or anything. Well, yeah. We're, we're yeah, I think to... I think that's actually a universal universal disease. But when people suddenly start to see how it bites, see where it plays out in their own lives, uh, then then they can get quite interested in the detail. So, and and all this brings you to some really interesting conclusions. It ought to be another quote. It ought to be clear from all this that the reason sin leads to death is not at all that death is an arbitrary and somewhat draconian punishment, which it's easy, you know, to, to raise that criticism for miscellaneous moral shortcomings. Death is the intrinsic result of sin, not simply an arbitrary punishment. So death is, a, is an outcome, not a, a penalty to pay. Yeah, it's well. I mean, it, it, you can see it as a penalty to pay, but um, it, it's it's like the difference between if I drive too fast around a corner and a policeman catches me, he may fine me forty pounds for going too fast. But if I drive too fast around a corner and there's some oil or snow on the road and the car comes off and lands in the ditch, then that isn't an arbitrary punishment. That is the direct result of, of what I've just done. Right. Right. Okay, Sky has to. Run. I do. I have to leave. Sky has to go pick up his daughter from school. <laughs> People always do this to me when I start talking about sin. <laughs> yeah, oh, it just got at, dark. I'm out oh, of here. Oh, look at the time. Thank okay, you, Doctor Wright. Sky, Sky, get out of here. Um, I have a few more minutes <laughs> with you as Sky runs away. So, so here's here's my ultimate question because I think this is fascinating stuff, and I hope everybody um, picks up the book and checks it out. Once you reorient your your brain this way and say, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not just trying to uh, accept Jesus getting in the way of the punishment that was headed my way so that I can escape this place and go to heaven, you know, stamp my passport to heaven. I have a vocation here, and he is enabling me, you know, he broke the powers that prevent me from doing my vocation how does that reorient my life? You know, speaking very practically as just a middle American follower of Jesus, how do I live differently because of this truth? I think the, the, the central thing, and one would say this from all sorts of angles, is worship, that we, we rediscover the importance of worship, of actually thoughtful, careful worship of God the Creator, God the Lover, God the Enabler, God the Redeemer, God the Recreator and simply relearning how to worship, how to use the Psalms, how to pray the Gospels, um, how to take the classic liturgies of the Church and literally, metaphorically, make them sing for us again. Um, this, is, this is the center of it all, because as we are looking at the true God and worshiping Him alone, then our humanness starts to get reordered. But that must immediately flow out into uh, God-reflecting activity within the world. That's the, the, the royal bit. If the priesthood bit is the worshipping bit, the royal bit is the service in the world. And then it's a matter of seeing how the mandate in Genesis 1 and 2 for humans to use wise words to bring God's order into the world, how that can flow out, for instance, into the Church's political task, speaking the truth to power, how it can flow out in terms of the Church speaking very practically into the needs of the poor, of the refugees, of of, of people who uh, are the subjects of God's special concern, according to the Psalms. Think of Psalm 72, for instance, where the the righteous king is righteous because he is looking after the poor and the widow and the defenseless and so on. And so when when Christians are worshipping,
worshipping the God in whose image they are made, they will become, um, whether they think it out or not, it, it's going to happen that they will be people who are bringing God's love and wisdom and gentleness and justice into the world. And there are a thousand ways in which that can happen. And then it's a matter of specific vocations to which ones are for you or for this community here and now. Right, right. And, and this, this does correct. Uh, last week, Sky and I talked about the history of the religious right in America and how partly through uh, eschatology we came to the conclusion that uh, we are so close to getting out of here, it doesn't really make any sense yeah. to spend time on social reform. You know, the Titanic is going down, stop yeah. stop yeah. repainting the deck, and let's man yeah. the lifeboats. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, so you're, you're also in that camp of, no, 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 we, you know, we let eschatology change are how yeah. we relate to the world let's yeah. you know let's go back to being image bearers with yeah. you know with a divine covenant from genesis and that was there actually in your earlier american culture up to the enlightenment period that in the 17th and early 18th century, um, the, the, the post-millennialism of that period was very definitely about bringing God's justice and hope to the world against the day when Jesus came back to, to complete his rule and his reign. And then uh, we, the Church has basically colluded with the split between uh, religion and politics, if you like, and has said, we're going to retreat into this private space against the day when God then rescues us and takes us off somewhere else. And uh, that, that, that is actually uh, kind of a, an ecclesial reaction from within the Enlightenment world, and a great deal of, of British Christianity as well as American Christianity has gone that route. Mm. Um, for me, the center of it actually comes back to um, where, where uh, Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, get on with your work because what you do in the Lord is not in vain. And Paul is there channeling a bit from Isaiah 49, which is an important passage for him, where the servant thinks that the servant's work is in vain and then is, is assured that this isn't in fact the case. And uh, we, we Christians can easily think, oh, this is hopeless. As you say, we're just painting the decks of the Titanic. Right. And Paul is assuring you, because of the resurrection, which means because of God's new creation, what you do in the present is not in vain. It's not wasted. Wow. Do you, do you have any, any advice for how... Uh, there's something happening next week in America. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, it's <laughs> some kind of an event where we go to the polls, and, and we have spent so much time debating how you know, Orthodox conservative Christians are, are responding yeah. to this situation. Yeah. Um, of, you know, is there, a, is there nothing more important than, than the laws that will come out of a Supreme Court? Is, you know, does well, character that, that's matter? Well, it's a very interesting question, because somebody asked me this in a meeting last week, and I gave a, an answer off the top of my head. I was talking with my wife afterwards, and she said, if they're asking you who you should vote for, the answer ought to be Michelle Obama, because actually we'd prefer to see her in the White House than to <laughs> any of the present candidates. Um, but granted, that's not an option if we're being realistic just for the moment. Um, I think what I want to say to my American friends is I understand your concerns about laws, etc. But you happen to be in the position of uh, electing the person who is going to be de facto the leader of the free world. Um, the rest of us sadly don't get to vote in this election, though it will affect um, all sorts of aspects of our life. But because of that, I think Americans need to think very seriously about whether they want to put into the White House and hence into global leadership somebody who, whether you agree with them or not on many policies, nonetheless does know what government, what statecraft, what um, all that sort of thing is about, or somebody who basically doesn't and has no experience of it. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I fully understand why some people think that um, Mrs. Clinton's policies and views are abhorrent and we should oppose them, but um, granted the mess that the system's got us in, um, the world doesn't need somebody like uh, the other candidate who um, could be a real disaster globally. Yeah, yeah. I would tend to agree with you, although uh, not all Christians do, and that's okay. I, I'm, I'm well aware, including some good friends of mine. <laughs> all right. Um, I've just, I had no idea that N.T. Wright Online existed. I just heard about it. We've already gone and visited it at ntwrightonline.org. You're teaching us classes 
online so we don't have to ride our bikes all the way over there to follow you around. This is fantastic. Uh, I, I quite agree. It, it's me, actually. It doesn't have to take quite so many plane rides around to all the people who want me to come and talk to them. Um, but, yeah, there's a, there's an online course now based on this book, The Day the Revolution Began, and there's 10 or a dozen other courses on different biblical books and themes, and there's more on the way. That is fantastic. So, seriously, check it out, ntwriteonline.org. I'm going to start taking some classes because every time, um, you know, I, I put I put you in the category of of, of a Dallas Willard. Um, and I, you know, I've also really that's a great been, compliment. Thank you. Yeah, the the uh, I had an ice cream cone with Dallas about two years before he passed on, <laughs> and I would definitely like to have an ice cream cone with you uh, before too long here. So you well, know, when you're in the U.S., let me know, or when I'm in the U.K., I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> okay. But I just, you know, there are very few thinkers and teachers that I learn more from. So I'm, bless you. Thank I'm you. going to be all over uh, online.org. And I wrote you a little song. I wrote you, usually at the end of the podcast, I, I make up a song and try to wing it. But sometimes they go so disastrously that, that you know, if I have someone on who has more things before their front name, than, than most people, then I'll, I'll actually try to give it a thought. So as I was driving to work this morning, I, I wrote a little song for our friend N.T. Wright. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. You can read him in the day, you can read him in the night when explaining Christianity. He's really out of sight, cause you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. Oh, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. His books are long, you can read them on a flight from Timbuktu to the Isle of Wight, cause you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. One more verse. Oh, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright right his thoughts are deep they're never trite are you finished yet he'll say not quite oh you can't go wrong with nt right you can read him on a plane or a train in the rain you can read him eating locks in a box with a fox or eating eggs and ham yes yes you can read him sam i am Oh, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. Even Stephen Colbert says he's all right. Oh, Catholic, Baptist, Mennonite. Y'all can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. No, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. Sing it, Archibald Asparagus. Oh, you can't go wrong with N.T. Wright. <laughs> Very good. Oh, Very good. I... I need a transcript of that. I'll, I'll, My kids will love it. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Thanks so much for being on the show. The book is The Day the Revolution Began, uh, Reconsidering the Meaning of Jesus' Crucifixion. Check it out and go to ntwriteonline.org uh, so you too can add more letters before the beginning of your name. Do you get anything? <laughs> if you take all your classes, do you get a certificate or a, a, a decoder ring or anything? Uh, you'd have to ask the management for that. All I do is talk to the camera and somebody else organizes all the lines. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time, thank Dr. Thank you Wright. very much. Very Good much talking appreciate to you. It. Thanks for your patience with, with the, the setup. Yes, thank you. All right. And we will see you all next week on the show. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Phil Vischer and you can support us so that we can spend more time trying to figure out how to hook up the camera to N.T. Wright in uh, Scotland. Thanks all. See you next week. The Phil Vischer Podcast is produced by Phil Vischer Enterprises and recorded live at Jellyfish Lab Studios. This episode was edited by Jason Rugg and was fact-checked by absolutely no one. For more information, go to philfisher.com. <laughs> <laughs>